Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Google Plus Hangout with the Buck Institute for Education. I'm John Larmer, Editor-in-Chief here at BIE. And our theme for the month of May is Spotlight Projects. So we're going to be talking about successful uh, student projects from throughout the year, as well as lessons learned, uh, perhaps from ones that were not so successful. But um, today we have some great guests talking about some big exhibitions of student work that were done by the uh, York County School District and uh, Metropolitan Nashville School District. So um, our Hangout will last about 30 minutes, and you can uh, post questions on the Google Plus events page. And I might pop in with questions for our guests as they arise, or perhaps save them for the end. And if they aren't answered for some reason, you can uh, uh, post them on Google Plus events page, and we'll answer them after the Hangout. This Hangout will be archived, so if you miss it or want to go back over some things, um, if your friends miss it, I should say, uh, you can uh, find it through BIE.org in our uh, Hangouts archive. Okay, uh, that's about all the logistics then. Let me uh, ask our participants to introduce themselves. So uh, let's go from right to left. Uh, Sonia, how about starting with you? Hey, I'm Sonia Mansfield. I work with Metro Nashville Public Schools. I am an academy coach at the school and am a lead coach for MNPS District. And this year I helped organize our middle school and high school project expo and also work with our teachers on their project-based learning. Okay, welcome, Sonia. Uh, Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Barr. I am a middle school science teacher in York County School District, and I am a member of our school division project-based learning 101 with Buck Education, and um, was a participant in our recent transformative learning and project fair at Grafton Middle School. Okay, thanks. Welcome, Kristen. And Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Cagle. I'm the principal at Grafton Middle School, and this was our first year um, that we um, hosted a student ex student work exhibition, and it was a wonderful learning experience. I'm looking forward to sharing more about it tonight. All right, thanks. Welcome. And Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Williams, and I'm superintendent of the York County School Division in York County, Virginia, and we have about 12,000 students and 19 schools. And as of July 1, I actually will be superintendent of Loudoun County Schools in Northern Virginia with about 70,000 students and 80-plus schools. So I'm very sad about leaving York, even as I'm excited about the opportunity in Loudoun. All right. Thanks for being with us, Eric. All right. So uh, let me give our driving question. How successful has PBL been this year, and what have we learned? That will be our question for the month. So we'll talk about that in today's Hangout. And our first more focused question for our guests is, uh, what were the exhibitions that your district held like? So tell us about what the events were like. And um, why don't I go in that same order for this one, then I'll mix it up a little. So Sonia, how about the Metropolitan Nashville event? Okay. This was our second year to have a project expo, and it was our first year to include the middle school students. And we had around 300 projects that were were shown at the event. We did this at Treveca Nazarene College. They opened up one of their exhibit halls for us. And we had the students, we had the high school students on one side of the room and the middle school students on the other. Brought in judges from our business partners and from the community as well as allowed high schools to judge the middle schools and vice versa. And using the Buck rubric, we gave the students a score based on their projects. Okay. About how, how many people were involved? How many projects were on display? There were about 300 projects on display. We had around 900 students involved. Wow. Okay. So it was a, very crowded. It's a big event. Okay. We had about 60 judges that came through during that day. And we did it in a one-day event, started at 8 in the morning, and finished up with a celebration that evening that wrapped up about 8 o'clock at night. Okay. Um, and then you all rested, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Sort of. <laughs> As much as you can in your job, yeah. All right, so let's hear about uh, York's event. Uh, Kristen, we'll start with you. Um, in York County, each of the schools held their own exhibition night, and it was really, I felt, a celebration of the great work that our students had been doing and had completed during the school year. So each grade and each subject was represented in our middle school exhibition. Um, I know other schools, high schools and elementary schools, had a similar evening on different nights, which I thought was great for multiple student families who 
could go to each night at the different schools rather than have to choose or split. Um, we had many people who elementary students came with parents and were able to see what their big brothers and sisters were doing. And it was really about showing not only parents but community members, school board members, what we were doing and the great things that our students were doing in the classroom. So each grade and each subject area had um, tables where people just kind of walked through and um, visited the different projects to see more about it. We had students there who were explaining their work, um, answering questions, fielding questions about what they did and why they did the particular project or what they learned through it. So um, I know I had at least one student who told me that they thought it was really cool they got to talk to powerful school board members and people who are so important um, in our community. So they were really proud of what they did and excited to share it with other people. Okay, great. So it was kind of, it was uh, both yours and, and uh, Sonia's descriptions, it's, it's more of a fair than it is a, you know, one at a time kind of presentation event. Is that correct? A fair where people walk around. Right. And, yeah, okay. Uh, Karen, yeah. Uh, you want to say some more? Yeah, Kristen and I are at the same school, yeah. and when we initially um, ventured into this um, project um, to plan for the showcase, we have about um, 875 students, so we have about 50 plus um, classroom teachers, and we had initially said we our expectation was at, to at least have each grade level and each um, subject area represented. Well, as the momentum built for the night, I mean, everyone turned out. It was so exciting. And so to see um, not only students excited to share their work, but teachers as well, it was a big event. And the families loved it. I had um, several families come up to me and said, we need to do this more than once a year. Could we do it every quarter? <laughs> <laughs> so I, it was a lot of work, but we all enjoyed it. It was a it was a wonderful um, celebration of what we do in our schools every day. All right, great. And Eric, want to add some more to this piece? Sure. So um, Karen and Kristen are at a middle school in our school division, and each of our 19 schools had an exhibition. Um, and most of them were in a particular week in April, some in other weeks in April, a few maybe in May. And the, the shared expectation that as principals and, and others we agreed on is that in each school at least 20% of teachers would participate along with students, and, but that that could look differently from one school to another, whether it was a grade level focus or department level focus. And so in the past, schools and teachers have done it, but this is the first time in our district that we've said, okay, we're going to have these exhibitions of student work um, all in the, in the springtime. So that was very powerful for us. Okay. All right. So um, let's go on to our next question then. Uh, let's hear about some of your favorite projects from the exhibition. Um, so why don't, uh, let's see, who should we talk with this time? Um, Kristen, how about you? Sure, I'll start. Um, one project that I thought was really successful is our most recent project-based learning unit um, on animals. Our students built a virtual zoo and it was a collaborative project with all of the seventh grade science teachers. So my students did it, but so did the other two science classrooms on our floor, on our grade. And so what the students did was they created and researched particular types of animals and um, put the information on a discovery education board through Board Builder. And then those were combined to create an animal house like you would visit at the zoo. So students toured the zoo as the kind of finale of the project and got the information about the different types of animals through what their peers and what their classmates had written. And um, I think it was just a lot more engaging and meaningful for them to create something that they knew that their classmates were going to learn from. So they um, were really striving to make the information accurate, make it complete, put pictures, include videos and things so that their classmates could really learn from what they had become an expert on. So that worked really well. A prior project that we did um, a unit, a project-based learning unit earlier in the year, I didn't include as much of an individual portion 
um, within their section of the zoo, they had a general type of animal, say reptiles, but then in this project, they had to then put an individual piece, a specific type of reptile to add to the zoo. So they felt more individually accountable. In a prior project, they mostly were graded on their group product, and so it was easier for people to kind of either take a big role and do all of the work or, you know, sit back and not do as much work. So I think that that was something we learned this year as far as developing the projects is to have that group component but then also make sure there's some individual accountability. So that worked well with our virtual zoo project. All right. That's a, that's like a good one. Uh, yeah, that's a definitely a valuable lesson to learn about how to, how to make sure students are pulling their weight on the team and are um, accountable for individual work too. All right, yeah. thanks, Kristen. Um, Sonia, anything more you want to say about projects you liked? I'm oh, sorry, not Sonia. Um, Karen, from um, what you saw at your school, some other projects you liked? Uh, some other projects. We did have our sixth grade science students work on the Mars colonization project. Um, they had to develop habitats for Mars to, um, so that we can survive on Mars when we travel there. Um, they had several groups, uh, several roles in this project. They not only constructed the habitats, but they also had to advertise um, to kind of get people to want to choose their habitat to go to if they're on Mars. During the project, they had had um, the head researcher from the local NASA um, come in to um, talk with them. They had several NASA uh, scientists and researchers come in, but I remember this one gentleman um, told me, he looked over at me while the kids were working on this, and he said, um, this is what my college kids are doing, this same project, and it's also what the researchers at NASA are doing, and it was so exciting, but that night the students um, shared their advertisements, they shared their habitats, and people voted on which the, um, the, our guests at the event voted on which Mars um, habitat they would visit. And so um, the kids really had to sh showcase it and say, hey, this is, you know, this is how we'll grow plants, this is how you'll have oxygen, this, you know, and they really had to um, share that. And what was so interesting was they made a lot of connections with colonization of Jamestown and the Americas. They make connections with the resources they need in the natural, like in a natural disaster, those kinds of foods and water resources. They'd also need um, similar resources on Mars. So it was it was very interesting to watch the kids make the connections. And I think all these kids will will probably vis visit Mars one day. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The connection between Mars and the Jamestown colony. Were they asked to do that, or did they just think of that? They made that connection because they were they studied the Jamestown colonization earlier in the school year, and so when they got ready to venture into this, the the science teachers were just amazed at the connections they were making um, with what they had previ previously learned. All right, that's great. I love the involvement of NASA engineers as part of the audience too. <laughs> yes. uh, okay, Eric, tell us about some of your favorite projects. Sure. So I'd like to talk with you about some elementary school students. And they started by reading a book about a dog and a cat that survived Hurricane Katrina. And the, the teacher used that to segue into eventually they posed a driving question, which was, how can we help dogs and cats in our community that do not have homes? So these students um, knew that there was an animal shelter down the street, and so they decided to write um, a book entitled 18 Reasons to Adopt a Dog. And so the students authored this book, they decided to make an audio book, they posted it on the school's website, it, it was published for peers, for family members, for neighbors, and then the shelter also plans to put it on their website. They also did digital PSAs in order to, to market some homemade dog biscuits, which they used as a fundraiser in order to raise money for the uh, animal shelter down the street. And you'll be happy to know that they were successful in finding a home for at least one dog, and they also made over $130, which they walked down the street and dropped off at the animal shelter. And this project was incredibly content-rich. There were so many connections with math, economics, 
social studies, and, and writing. And this particular school actually has not done its exhibition yet. They're going to have a film festival. They're a fine arts magnet school. And so in contrast to most of our schools, which are doing more walk-through fairs or gallery walks, this particular school is having a film festival. And these students have been taking capturing digital content to, t to capture their work and reflect during the process on their work. And so the point of their video that they'll be sharing at the exhibition, the teacher has said both to inspire other kids to do work, but then also to um, show their learning during this process. And so that's been in incredibly powerful. And I'll, make, I'll give a briefer description of one other project that I've been particularly impressed with. And that's at another one of our elementary schools. The kids had read the book Wonder, which um, and the protagonist in that is is Augie, who um, who has a facial deformity. And out of this grew a project to encourage others to choose kind, which is kind of like a tagline from that book. And the kids end up writing their own precepts or morals for good living. And they ended up doing a drive within the school to uh, to promote these precepts. They were inspired to action by Skyping with a young student about their age who actually does have a facial deformity. And at their exhibition night, before doing the fair portion, there was a whole group portion in which they showed some video clips, again, of the process, because the point was to show the process of the learning and not just the final products, which in these cases were the public service announcements encouraging people to choose kind, as well as written books giving in-depth stories behind their precepts that they'd created. Okay, that's great. What a powerful story. And, and I like the point that um, sharing the process is important. Uh, the product doesn't always capture it. You can't tell what students learn sometimes by just seeing a one-minute PSA or whatever. So I like that angle of sharing the process with, with visitors. And John, just a quick elaboration on that. So for example, something that's captured in the footage is kids sorting by tens. So one of the first grade math skills is, um, is tens place. And so sorting by tens and bags, those dog biscuits, and then also estimating after a week of sales what they thought they would make after two more weeks of sales. And so that's an example of the process that's captured and will be featured in that video. All right. All right. Very good. Nice to hear about the math content there. Uh, Sonia, what were some of your favorite projects? Well, I have two that kind of represent extremes in our school. The first one was with our business academy. It built off of a project last year where the students learned more about home ownership in their community and the value of, was it more valuable for them to rent or to be homeowners. And our school is one of the highest poverty schools in our district. And from the data the students gathered, about 75% of our families rent their home or rent their apartment. And that leads to a lot of transition in our school. So building off of last year's project where they took a mobile classroom and learned from a real estate agent and a home, I guess you'd call it a flipper now, um, learning about home ownership and how to increase the value of a home in their neighborhood. This year they, they built on that, learned more about budgeting, financial literacy, and worked with one of our partners, Fifth Third Bank. And the students went into the bank with a sheet predicting what, where they would be at age 28 what their job would be, what kind of car they would have, if they had bought the car, were renting, what kind of home. And they all applied for home loans and went through that process. Some were declined, some um, received their home loan, and it showed them the value of what was sort of what was important to them and what, how that would affect their ability to buy a home in the future. And it was just a really cool process because a lot of them challenged their parents it was one of those times where you're so excited because the project that's being done at school goes home and, and some parents called and said why are you why are you having my kid come home and ask me this you know our credits bad and and I'm embarrassed but we were able to connect them back to the school and the students um, excuse me the the business partner and help the parents clean up their credit and so it's a project that is trying to transform a community that surrounds that school and hopefully eventually will stabilize the neighborhood. So that's on one end and the one that brought me to tears was our life skills students 
and it started last year as well. Last year the life skills students in their classroom have a washer and dryer and the sports teams would come in and do their laundry and sometimes wouldn't get back to pick it up and different things and the kids the, the kids in the class said we can do this for them why don't we take over the laundry service and the life skills teacher who is with those students all day long developed into developed it into a project where they would learn how to run a business just like a laundry service would so a company in town was brought in to talk to the students about uh, cost per pound about how to budget how to predict what um, what their expenses would be and so the students that are not generally allowed in not allowed is the wrong word that are not generally in the regular education classroom and reg regular education system were able to experience a lot of what the other students get and a really cool piece to it was our chemistry teacher came in and taught the students about emulsions and about um, bleach and the effects of bleach on fabrics and so the students who don't go into a chemistry classroom got that experience and and understood that that experience um, and the final result was they ended up partnering with the nonprofit in the neighborhood that services and finds shelter for homeless people during the winter time and our students still continue to do laundry for them and connected saved them money, used our resources, and connected with one of the local colleges to deliver the laundry back and forth. And our students could run through the budget, the cost, what they would be making if it were charged. They were able to talk about how they could write that off on taxes if they were doing that as a volunteer. Um, and so for students who, some of which were nonverbal, some of which had cerebral palsy and had physical conditions that kind of limit what people think they can do, this project showed how much they can do. And I think it opened a lot of eyes. And the best part of it was at the exhibition, their teacher was allowed to stay with them because it was in their IEP. And the kids said, no, you have to leave. We're going to do this by ourselves. And so as people came around to interview, she stood in the aisleway and cried because they didn't want her around anymore. And they knew they could handle it on their own. So wow. that, that one was the most impactful for me because it made a difference with kids who normally people go, oh, they can't do it. Yeah, wow, that's a great story. I can see why it brought tears to your eyes. Um, all right, thank you, Sonia. That's a good one. All right, let's, um, let's get to our, our two final questions. We're, well, the clock is ticking, about eight minutes left. Um, so let's talk about the purpose of this. What, why did you do these exhibitions? What purposes do they have? And um, Eric, you want to start? Or? Um, sure. I'll talk about from a, a district per perceptive, uh, okay. perspective, but this also applies to school as well. I am thrilled with how our ex exhibitions are promoting a shared instructional vision among our staff members, but also with external stakeholders as well. So I know after one of the exhibitions, teachers came up to me and were talking about how excited they were and they were already planning next year's project um, and the exhibition and talk about cycle of inquiry they were immediately reflecting because they were just so excited there was real joy in teaching because of it and other teachers who weren't involved in a project but attended an exhibition were also inspired and say hey I see these colleagues that I respect having this success with their students and so yeah this makes sense to me and so part of it is a shared vision internally part of it though is also getting external stakeholders excited including parents and so as we work in our district to promote a mentality that's not just test prep mentality sometimes you know parents want to know high, um, parents of high achieving students want to know that their kids are still gonna succeed on standardized tests and so these exhibitions really show parents um, the depth of learning and so that's important for us in terms of building a shared vision. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, Karen, Kristen, maybe uh, some thoughts, uh, quick thoughts about um, about the purpose of, of it from your point of view. Yeah, I, w I would like yeah, to I think it's just a great opportunity to extend the walls of our classrooms to share what we're doing to have students 
share their work and show their pride, show that they do have um, a stake in what they do and that they are enjoying it. I mean, a lot of students see school as something that they just have to do and they have to come in and out of. It's really refreshing, I think, for teachers to see students get excited about what they're doing in the classroom and sharing what they're doing in the classroom and also being able to see what other people are doing. So they got to see what the eighth grade students do. So when they move up to eighth grade from seventh grade, they have an idea of what they're going to do. They're excited to go to the different classrooms and do eighth grade science or eighth grade history. And so it kind of eases some worry about transition and allows them to anticipate and become excited about what they're going to do. From a teacher's perspective, I don't get to go to a lot of other classrooms, so it was really nice to see what ideas other teachers were using in their classroom, what was working for them, what programs they used, and to really get to see what else was going on on other halls and other grades and in other subject areas. So I thought that was professionally really valuable as well. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Karen? I'd like, to, I'd like to add that the level of student engagement in the building, um, all year long we've been collecting data on, st on student engagement, and I actually sat down and looked at the data um, this past week with my leadership team, and the difference in the levels of student engagement increased so much throughout the um, school year as students were working on these projects. And Kristen can attest to this, how we talked as a school right before spring break about how we were so amazed at how engaged the students were the day before spring break, the week before spring break. And e I mean, right on the, uh, through the exhibition, they were in get you would walk in classrooms and it was 100% student engagement. They were learning and um, collaborating and just it was um, it was very the data showed the engagement but also it, you know through the anecdotal records that we kept and so forth that the students were um, engaged through this process. All right, great, great to hear. Um, and Sonia, what were some of the purposes that you saw? In addition to everything that they've already said, we saw those same same benefits. Um, but from another perspective, I think it was a great marketing tool for our district to the community so that they could see what's really happening in the schools because I think in public schools we tend to get a bad reputation that nobody's learning anything and I think when the, the business people that came in to view that and the like she said, the parents that came in to view, it, it gave them a different perspective to realize the students and what they're learning and and from the students, it improved their 21st century skills, those soft skills, those things that we as teachers tell them is so important with communication. And it was a chance for them to practice those skills with someone other than that teacher, that parent that they see all the time. And I think it was a really valuable experience for those students to be in that, in that circumstance. And a lot of our students actually used it as a networking tool. And we had a couple good summer jobs out of it, so wow. that's beneficial as well. <laughs> All right, an anticipated purpose for that one. All right, great. All right, good comments, Sonia. So um, we only have, like, my God, uh, about one or two minutes left, so it's time for, like, a one-sentence description of lessons learned um, about how to conduct an exhibition of student work like this. So um, let's see, anybody want to jump in with a lesson learned? I'll hop in. I'd say give right. voice and choice to adults in planning and implementation of exhibitions so it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Okay, uh, Karen, Kristen? I, ag I agree, but I would say voice and choice with the students as well, getting more students involved in sharing their work. Okay. Kristen, you have a sentence on lessons learned? Um, just go for it. You'll make mistakes, but learn from those mistakes and involve as many students as you can and um, reflect and go at it again next time. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and Sonia, a, a last word and a lesson learned from you. From a district level, start planning early, meet often, and communicate thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> Set strong deadlines. 
Okay. All right. Word to the wise. Okay. So let me um, sum up with some key takeaways that we got out of this uh, wonderful hangout. Um, that exhibitions like this of student work are a great marketing tool for the district, the school, help promote a shared vision, and helps uh, teachers get ideas from each other. Obviously, increases student engagement and ownership, and is a celebration of, of the hard work students and teachers have done. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, we heard about having, uh, or one idea I heard earlier was having project-specific exhibitions throughout the year, not just at the end. Parents even ask for them more frequently, as Sonia said. Uh, firm deadlines for getting projects done and ready for exhibitions. Uh, common expectations for the adults in terms of um, their voice and choice. And find ways to increase student voice, so it's not just teachers explaining their projects, but students doing most of the talking. So great points, and uh, thank you, guests. We don't have time to come back to you all for a goodbye, but you, you had final statements that sort of sounded like perfect, perfect conclusions to this. So let me just say goodbye to our viewers and remind you this is archived at BIE.org. We'll be here again uh, next week, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, e 8 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll be hearing from some elementary school teachers uh, and their spotlight projects from the year. So thanks, Eric, Karen, Kristen, and Sonia. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.